which is awesome. Welcome to B-Sides! We're going to be talking about Johnny Q. CISO just got a new Red Team Bug Bounty and S-Class. Why do we put those things together? S-Classes are expensive. All these things, these shiny offset programs are expensive. The question is, what's worth chasing? Why do you chase it? And um, how, do you how do you keep up? So do we have any CISOs in here that just want to learn some trade rag lingo? Because you'll get it, I promise. No one's going to admit that. All right. I'm not a CISO. I don't own a Mercedes. I will gladly drive yours. Um, I haven't quite figured out how to graduate. My, my German stops at R, doesn't go to S. Does anyone even know what that means? Anyone? Know what that means? Okay. Anyway, uh, enough about the cars. We'll, we'll, we'll do the analogy here just for this one. It's actually uh, interesting uh, because one of my uh, CISOs actually has an S class and a new bug bounty program and a new red team program. And he said, that's not fair. That resembles me. So anyway, I'm, I've got 15 years in IT and InfoSec. I'm Red Team Director at Fortune 1. I, when I say Fortune 1, I mean of the Fortune 500,000, whatever it is. Anyone know where that is? The small little chain of stores. Um, if you're interested in Alphabet Soup, uh, FICO credit scores, Pedigree, connect with me on LinkedIn. You can get all there, I'm sure. Um, I am a former Kansas City resident. lived here for um, five, six years. Yeah, there, I got one whoop, all right. Um, so, there we go. So first of all, print, I'm obligated to put this in. Uh, this presentation represents my personal opinion and in no way reflects my uh, employer's opinion. If you haven't figured out who that is, go figure that in. Just go Google Fortune 1, go figure that out. Uh, take all your advice, or all of my advice at your own risk. Do not run with scissors. And any resemblance to an actual CISO named Johnny Q is complete happenstance, unintentional, but he actually drives an Audi, not an S-Class, not a Mercedes. Uh, so quick, what are we going to talk about? Um, we're going to keep up with the Cecil Joneses here, right? So, um, especially the offensive security programs, all the new shiny things, these things, red teaming, purple teaming. Uh, we're talking a little bit about hiring versus outsourcing, the trade-offs, uh, bug bounties, and if you're interested in this from a career aspiration, we're going to talk about all this kind of stuff. We're not hacking in S-Class, although this was a great tweet about a year ago or so. Um, you can actually see that <laughs> Mercedes S-Class from 2013 actually has a bunch of really cool tools out there. Go find that tweet. Um, so, first of all, what is Offsec? Um, anybody familiar with this, tra this uh, training company? Any anybody gone through and uh, tried harder? Yeah, okay. Um, big fan of this company, but it's not what we're here to talk about, of course. Uh, we're just talking about the discovery of vulnerabilities uh, before the bad guys get them, right? So whether they're logical or process or human or social or whatever, right? So classic boring definition of pen testing. Almost everyone in this room should know what this is, but we'll do it anyway, and I'll even read to you to drone this on. The practice of testing a computer system application or network to find vulnerabilities an attacker would exploit. Here's the thing, and we've and even uh, Chris was kind of hitting on this earlier, right? So um, it's not vulnerability scanning, right? So what if I told you SSL scan does not equal pen test? I think there's at least one person in this room that knows exactly the context of when I first threw this meme around, because uh, we've experienced this before, right? It requires exploitation of vulnerabilities, right? You actually have to do something because there are bugs out there that aren't exploitable and maybe we don't care about them, right? So pen testing probably doesn't include exploit development. You're probably not going to be a debugger, but you could. It just depends on your line of work, right? This is where it gets kind of gray area um, if you're dealing with um, things like security research. There are some cool firms out there that go do binary analysis on products. Most people that do pen tests aren't going to be getting into debuggers, but there it is. Um, and, of course, pen testing is great when you can couple it with the SDLC, software development life cycle. Um, but that's a whole other talk, and we're really not even going to talk into this. We're just going to get into this pen testing thing so we can compare it to red teaming and some other stuff. So, Johnny Q says, hey, I've got some hiring tips for you. If you're going to hire pen testers, the first of, one of the most important things is to hire for uh, curiosity and creativity, right? Um, some of the best ones I've ever seen have development backgrounds, but not all of them. Some of them have taught themselves to code as a result of uh, becoming a pen tester, right? Um, don't get hung up on college degrees. Uh, I have guys that work for me that have basically dropped out of high school, and I've got guys that work that almost had a PhD, and all in between, right? So it just depends on, uh, on, on the person more than the education. If you're going to go uh, the AppSec route, and you're going to do looking at applications, it really, really, really helps a lot to have a dev background, even if you're not even if for no, no other reason than just to, to understand what the developer was thinking at the time, right? Um, from the network side, of course, you want to have enterprise systems knowledge, uh, anything you can think, big picture, scale. We're not talking about hacking a single Linux box on a lab. We're talking about scale, right? Um, Johnny Q also says, hey, heck yeah to the OSCP, right? If you, 
you're going to hear this theme through this. I'm a big fan of offsex program. I'm much less of a fan of the other training programs that are out there. Um, the GXPN from SANS is pretty good. Uh, it's not as good as the OSCP in my opinion. And um, just say no to the CEH. <laughs> just say no. So John Q says, here's some career tips, All right? Um, if you're interested in this, participate in CTFs. Do capture the flag tests. I mean, this, we had some today, that's great. Um, do them whatever you can. There's, there are a ton of them that are online. It's a great learning experience, right? Go through them. Uh, follow hackers on social media. Um, I learned probably three-fourths of the things that are emerging from Twitter these days. Um, so definitely follow them. Uh, and when you do follow them, uh, make sure that you're replicating the latest attacks in your lab, right? Don't just say, oh, that's really cool. That's one little, like, 140 character PowerShell thing, and I can do something really cool. Go play with it. Actually test it. Because to me, if I don't actually play with it, it's just head knowledge, and I'll eventually lose it. Right? But if I actually go through it, I'll remember it. Uh, John Q says, hey, absolutely, do participate in bug bounty programs. It's a great way to get in there uh, and, and not only just uh, improve your uh, capabilities, it's a good way to you know line your pocketbook a little bit. Also, a good way to, to fill up your uh, resume. I see the Bug Crown t shirt staring over there. There you go. There we go. Um, and definitely do the OSCP, right? So, from a tools perspective, uh, you'll see things like Metasploit, Burp, um, and but I put on here two programming languages. Why? Because the best pen testers I know make their own tools when they need to, right? So, Johnny Q says, hey, after you get that pen testing program in place, keep calm and hire a red team, right? So, um, red teams get this is a, a very controversial topic. Uh, there's been a lot of uh, chatter, tweet storms about what the difference really is. Uh, in some ways, red teaming is um, a response to the fact that pen testing has been watered down over the years. And you can call it whatever you want to call it. You can, we could call it, you know, um, spelunking. We can call it whatever you want. The point is that the actions have to be a certain, a certain thing. And in my definition here, we're talking about simulating an adversary's TTPs, the tactics, techniques, and procedures, right? Um, this is important and it's best really when we start comparing it and contrasting it with pen testing. So let's just do that real quick. Pen testing is typically limited in scope, right? You've got, here's your IP range, or maybe a host, or a collection of hosts, or here's your application, here's your boundaries. Uh, red teaming generally is, is practically unlimited scope, it's a large scope, right? So in pictures, here's your pen test scope. Here's your wall, here's your little thing. You say, hey, it's really hard to get up in there, right? It looks nice and secure, I, I can't scale it, you know, they're dropping hot tar on me or whatever. But the reality is, red team scope is the whole thing, right? Like we just go, huh, that's really interesting. Let's just, what's behind this curtain over here, right? And walk back around and we find the things that are, that were generally out of scope for one reason or another. It could have been just the way that the projects were scoped out. It could have been, who knows, right? So pen testing is testing a target scope. Red teaming is really testing a target organization. That's very, very important difference there. Um, also, pen testing is typically whitelisted, right? You come in through a known host, it's trusted, and it goes through, and maybe you even whitelist it right through the firewalls and IPSs and everything else, and it just does its stuff, which is kind of like, what's the point? Those are all layers in the solution, right? Red teaming is full security stack, so we don't announce, we don't come on whitelisted, known, you know, unicorn horses as we come in. We, we come the, the ways that the, the, the actual bad guys, the bad guys, the actual adversaries would, right? Um, as a result, pen testing tends to be noisier than red teaming. It's not always noisier, but it tends to be more noisy because your, your goal is, I'm gonna throw everything in the kitchen sink at this thing, and I wanna see what sticks. I'm gonna fuss it, right? Or I'm gonna do whatever. I'm gonna run Nessus at it, or whatever it is, and get some data back, and then I'm gonna take my actions, and then I'm gonna do my, my stuff, right? Red teaming is much more covert. Um, pen testing is really aimed at preventing breaches. The whole notion is, hey, we're gonna go find these breaches, or these vulnerabilities before the bad guys actually breach them. Uh, red teaming has really got this mentality of, at some point, you're gonna be breached if you're not already. Let's assume that breach, let's model that breach. You got this nice little uh, tweet here. If you guys have never seen this tweet before, I'm sorry, but you gotta get it now, right? So give a man an O-Day and he'll have access for a day. Teach a man to fish and he'll have access for life from the Grug, right? So that's the reason why we model this, because you can go do a pen test and you can find that O-Day and that custom web application or whatever, that's great. But as soon as that's fixed, it's done. The deal is, there's always gonna be somebody clicking on a kitten, right? So, pen testing is test uh, technical and logical. Uh, red teaming tends to also go beyond that with physical and social engineering, right? So, uh, it's not very often that you're on a pen test and you're allowed to actually go and, unless it's specifically in your SAO or inside your rules of engagement, to go call somebody and say, hey, I'm from, you know, over here, I need help with the help desk, or please respond, reset my password or whatever it is. Um, or go on site and actually just start, hey, I wonder if I could just walk tailgate in. 
that kind of stuff there generally is frowned upon and out of scope, but in Red Team it generally is in scope. Um, pen testing is all about exploiting bugs. Red Teaming, big deal, big news splasher, right? Bugs are not required. Humans may just click on the thing, or there may just be a place where you can walk right in and drop a box on the network and they don't care, right? Just because they're not going to challenge it. Bugs are not required. Pen testing stops at the shell. How many of you guys have seen a pen test report and like we ran MS08067 on this thing and got an eye, blah, 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 who am I? Slash groups. Here we go. Look, I'm admin. The end, right? That's where red teaming starts, right? Red teaming says, okay, I got a shell. I got a shell. What other shells can I get? Where can I move to? What can I do? Right? So as a result of that, pen testing is about exploitation, whereas red teaming is really about this post exploitation concept. But what do I do beyond that? So getting in versus lateral movement. Um, another thing that people tend not to realize is um, pen testing is really generally more on the, the regulatory side. Like you got some compliance body like PCI or whomever, or maybe it's just an internal policy compliance that says go pen test these things, go pen test all the things as the projects come out. Um, red teaming is not about that. I have never seen, has anyone here seen a red team mandated from any kind of compliance regula regulation of any kind? I've never heard of one. Uh, and there's a reason for that. It's, it's really about training and improvement, not just, um, it's really because you're testing the whole org, right? So when you're doing pen testing, you're hiring for, like I said, regulatory test coverage. You want to make sure I've got full coverage of this particular application of this system. I want to make sure that we're actually testing it correctly and we're not missing any bugs on its way out the door before it gets turned on. Um, red team, you don't hire a red team to do that. You hire a red team to learn about yourself. And this is something that a lot of orgs think they might, and this is a really subtle thing for anyone that didn't claim to be a CISO earlier when I asked. Don't ask for this just because Johnny Q CISO at the other org down the street where you do your breakfast monthly meetups says, hey, I got a red team. Don't go and do one just because he does, because you're gonna learn something about yourself that you may not wanna know. Right? Be, only be ready to do it when you're actually really, really, really ready to learn. So, hiring tips for red team. Hire for diversity, but not that kind of diversity. Web, Windows, Linux, Mac, mobile, database, infrastructure, shell sherpas. Anyone heard the term shell sherpas? That's uh, Raphael Mudge's um, term, yeah. So um, it's really important to have a very diverse team because enterprises have a lot of stuff. And the bigger the enterprise, the more of the lot of stuff you're gonna have. So you don't wanna have a team that's like nine guys that are all good at AppSec, because you're not gonna be very good. What you really want is when you're staffing up a team, you wanna make sure that you've got all of these things covered as well as you can and go through and actually go and do an honest self-assessment what skills do we not have on the team? And then go fire, find somebody, in the, I didn't say go fire somebody. <laughs> go find somebody and hire them. Find and hire became fired. That was slip. <laughs> I'm about to get past it. Let's hang out here for a second. Yeah, so you go, go find somebody that has those gaps and then bring them in. Another important thing, there's something magical about the number three. Uh, the word is red team, it's not red couple. It's not red pair, it's not red person, it's red team. Uh, something magical happens about three people. One, for one example, how many people like to work more than eight hours a day as just a general rule, like you just love it? Yeah, yeah, there's a handful, but most people, you know, like eight hours, 10 hours, whatever, right? But all the time, no. What's really interesting about an organization is that they have to be secure 24 hours a day. One neat little thing about having a team of three is that can be split up into three eight hour shifts. And if you work a little bit longer then you have your overlap and your handoff and everything else, that's just one example. Uh, the other thing is you need to have people that have those multiple roles, just back to the diversity comment that I made a minute ago. So there's something really kind of special about three. So if you're sitting here talking to Johnny Q. Cizo, and he says, I'm gonna go staff up a red team, uh, I'm gonna go uh, open up two recs, two FTE recs for this red team, tell them, no, don't waste your time. Start at three or don't do it. So career tips. If you're wanting to get into this, start with studying real, real world breaches. Real world breaches, that's hard to say. Um, this is important because if you, you're, what, you're, what we're trying to do is we're trying to model the real world as much as we can. We don't want to go off of some theoretical breach where this guy you know, says, if I'm riding a unicorn and I stand on one foot and I shoot an arrow, then suddenly a shell will appear. This is something we got to make sure that it actually looks like something that's actually been done. right? So um, we look at things like, hey, uh, we just saw the breach that happened at the DNC. They popped shell, ran minicats, moved, ran minicats, moved, ran minicats, moved, got domain admin, gold tickets, got all the data, got out. That's a real breach. Mimic those things. Also, have a background in pen testing, right? 
Um, it's not required. I, I know a lot of uh, people that could be really good at, at red teaming without having a background in, red uh, in pen testing, and this seems kind of weird, right? Uh, but their answer for that is pretty simple. Um, if you are a really good admin, then you'll know how to be a really good malicious admin. And then somebody else on your team with the skill set of knowing how to exploit a box and get a shell, or social engineer to get a shell, can go do that. And you can have a really good admin come in and actually just manage all the shells as if they are just managing machines in a covert, mean, dastardly, evil kind of way. So pen testing is good to have a background in that. Uh, but it's not required. Um, but absolutely, do, new, do learn how to collaborate with the team. If you can't collaborate with a team, you can't work with a team, then you're not going to have a team of three minimum. You're going to have three minus, I mean, whatever it is, N minus one, and you're a jerk, and you don't need to be on the team. Uh, collaboration is extremely important. So make sure you, you can do that. If you can't do that, don't do this. Um, another thing that's, uh, this is a really common phrase these days, learn how to live off the land. I love this phrase. Uh, there's a really good reason for it. I love this tweet as well. Um, a sufficiently advanced threat actor is indistinguishable from a competent system administrator. Why would I drop a tool that has a signature that's going to touch a bunch of stuff on a machine when, going back to the thing this morning, I can run all those net commands, net user this, net whatever. I can run whatever's native. If there's PowerShell there, I can run that. If it's a Linux environment, I can use whatever's available in Bash. If there's a configuration management tool in the enterprise and I can just take it over and just use that as my command control, that is awesome. So those are the types of things that um, they need to be looking at. So there's tools like Cobalt Strike, Empire, uh, Responder, all those kinds of neat little tools that take pen testing to the next level, so we're talking about lateral movement, those are great. Um, also on here, another theme, custom C2, right? This goes back to development. So when I say C2, I mean command and control. Um, these are skills that I think any good red team at some point is going to hit their limitation as to what C2 tools they can use, right? If you go buy an off the shelf or if you go use an open source one, at some point you're going to eventually get the organization where they have signatures for all the binaries you're going to drop. And they have signatures for all the type of, of network traffic that goes across that's associated with it and you're going to be extremely limited. Whereas a real threat actor is going to go dev up something new, right? And when they dev up something new, you should be doing the same sort of thing. So let's talk hiring versus outsourcing. This gets somewhat controversial. Uh, so first, the pros of direct hire, right? So obviously you can retain knowledge, right? You hire somebody and you get, them, you get to keep them in the org, they get to learn the environment, you get deeper exploitation after each iteration, that's great. You also get less lead time for testing. So uh, how many people have dealt with a consulting group and they said, well, yep, we got an opening for you in 12 weeks. And you're like, but I want it now. Right, that doesn't work. Uh, another pro is you get to do the nonstop all year long testing. You can't just go, well, I can hire these people over here and I can test this quarter in 12, you know, like 12 weeks from now. And then I can wait another you know, 12 weeks after that to get a schedule and another one in there for this other project and whatever, right? Uh, another one, no consultant mic drop, right? So <laughs> how many people have been over here like, here's your, here's your report. Thank you for this check. I'm out, right? So that's... When you got people directly on, on staff, that's that's a pro. You don't you don't have this, but there's cons, right? Nothing's easy. Um, it's expensive, right? So you have to pay for an you know an FTE salary plus their benefits all year long, right? Uh, that's just let's just say it's just one pen test you need. There will come a time where that doesn't make sense, right? Um, also, there's conflicts of interest. If you are a small shop and you want to have somebody that has this kind of skill set on board, and they're also your systems engineers, they're either going to be exploiting things that they put in, right? Or they're going to be not very, you know, like they're either going to be really good pen testers and bad system engineers, or they're going to be really good system engineers and bad pen testers. You can't chase two dogs, right? Or the dog can't chase two masters, right? Is that old saying? So it's just a conflict. Um, another con, dance with the one you brought, right? So you hire these guys, they're here, they're on your team, you need to invest in their training. If you don't invest in their training, you don't have the budget to do that, well guess what? You hire them at this level, they're never going to progress beyond that level, and so you're going to have insufficient test coverage and all that stuff, so that's a con. Um, there's also specialized hardware, right? You're going to have to buy stuff, it's not just as simple as hiring somebody. Uh, pretty much these days, if you're pen testing and you're not using a MacBook Pro, it's probably because you're not touching a variety of things. Uh, so MacBooks are more expensive. Just an example, you might have VMs, cloud hosts, maybe some wireless testing gear, whatever, you're going to have extra stuff, and you need to make sure you have that budget in it. Uh, another con that some people look at is the same set of eyes, right? So I hired these three people, and they go, and they, they're the same six eyes that look at these systems all of the time. 
and they've got the six, same, uh, six eyes of the same strengths and the same weaknesses. And so the things that they find every time might be the same things they find every time, and they might miss stuff because they're not familiar with it or whatever it might be. There's a lack of testing diversity, right? So, um, but there's some pros to outsourcing as well. You get to pay for what you need. 24-7, 365 is what you do on the FTE side, but not necessarily with uh, outsourcing, right? This is a great one. We get to bring in that, that big name guy that's on Twitter, that person that spoke at Black Hat last year. You can go bring him in. Um, you also can solve this problem of rotating talent. How many people have ever heard of a CISO that says, I'm gonna switch uh, pen test firms every single year just because that way I have test diversity and that way, and whatever, you know, you can do that kind of thing. Um, you can also do rare, rare skill sets. There's only, I think, two people that I know that I would trust as of right this point to go actually hack on, an, uh, on a mainframe because there's not very many people that have that skill set. It's a lot less common, right? Um, so, but there's cons to that, right? So you got budget concerns. So let's just say, um, for example, you got $120,000 this year, your small shop, and that's aimed at four quarterly pen tests at 30,000 a piece, which I think is actually a little bit on the low side depending on what you're doing. And then something happens like the sand throws like 24 hard drives in a day. And oh no, we need to go buy a bunch of stuff. So we reallocate money. There goes $60,000 of Jenkins from this pen test budget because you haven't spent it yet. It's gone. So now you're left to two semi-annual pen tests, right? That's, that's the one side. The other way you can look at it is, hey, I can hire an entry level pen tester, salary, benefits, and training, and really probably come out about the same, and they can test all year long. But you know, what am I, what am I getting? Am I getting a better test or not? It really depends, right? Entry level testers not going to find as many things, but if you've got a ton of low hanging fruit in there, it might be a better investment of time. It's just an example. Uh, that big name talent that you saw on Black Hat, they're not going to come in for the same price as the entry level. They're going to be expensive, right? Um, and for all of the consulting um, uh, people in the room, all of the sponsors, pay no attention to this slide. I'm going to debunk the how how this stuff works, right? So. When you hire a consultant, this is the magic number of math, roughly, that happens behind the, side, behind the scenes, right? That consultant's um, salary and benefits and whatever training and hardware expenses and all that stuff that goes with an FTE, you're still paying for a chunk of that, right? They've got, that's got to be paid from somewhere. So that's out there. So you roughly take all that, divide by 2,000 for 2,000 hours a year, multiply it by the number of engagement hours they expect. You know, they say, hey, we got you for a month. That means 40 hours. Um, so we're going to go do that, right? That happens too. I've seen it on the other side. I've been on the consulting side too. So, and then you're gonna, of course, you're gonna slap your margin in there, whatever it is. I'm throwing 40% out of here. Some shops do more, some do less. And then, of course, you've got those travel expenses, the marketing overhead, the sales commissions, the, the dinner you thought was great and free from the sales guy. Guess what? You're paying for it. Your company is, right? It's all in there. The golf trip, whatever, it's all there, right? So, at some point, you're gonna say, hey, there might be a tipping point to direct hire for out of fiscal responsibility. Just depends. And, of course, this is my favorite one. Consultant bench. <laughs> the consultant you expected, Brent Farr. The consultant you got, Uncle Rico. Right? How many people have heard this line before? Don't worry, the junior consultant has a lifeline to the principal consultant. Uh, at one point, I was the junior consultant that did not have a lifeline, but was told I had a lifeline to the principal consultant. I've seen that stuff happen. That's usually like, hey, can you help me with this? Um, when you're free, later, maybe, and, and, and you, you know, as a consultant in that kind of environment, anyone that's been in consulting knows that sometimes you don't get this help because you're, you're, you're a principal consultant, he's billable just like you are, he's got to go build to his clients and, and helping you out is time that he's not billing over there and then, you know, if the incentives are wrong, it's just, it's just a big problem, right? So, uh, this can be a con. So, let's talk about some creative staffing on a budget. So, here's what Johnny QCZO might recommend you do. Hire a junior mid-level pen tester, then go and contract out some senior level people to come in and help, you know, for any short term, short term engagements, and then just have that FTE on staff shadow those consultants. But guess what? You're gonna have to be very careful with your language and with the provider you choose, because not all consulting shops are gonna like this idea, but some will work with you on things like this. So the question is, hire or outsource? I'm not gonna give you an answer. It depends, right? It just really depends. So, um, it's the end of the day nearly. Are, is anyone sick of hearing the term pet purple team today? <laughs> you said it the most. <laughs> I hate it on it too. <laughs> but that's true, that's true. So here we go. We'll, we'll do the, um, I don't have crayons. I love your, I'm gonna have to borrow the crayon with the bullet going through it or whatever that was, that was a great image. I'll send it to you. All right, thank you. <laughs> 
So um, obviously red plus blue equals purple, or offense plus defense equals one team. Um, I like to just explain to, you, to people that this is just a, a really simple example of not doing this. You don't just take whatever you've got as like the consultant side and, and just throw it over the wall and say, here you go guys, here's your report, right? Like, I'm out. It's the notion that uh, breakers can help fix too, and that you know your goal is to move a needle. It is some sort of a needle. It might be on a dashboard that doesn't make a lot of sense as we've seen today, but it's still to move it forward. Um, I find that this is practically impossible with outsource uh, pen testing and red teaming, um, unless, of course, you've got one particular thing, a very large, very specific, expensive sale. Because the reason is uh, you're not going to find most, of, most, most pen test consulting shops are ready to do that kind of a contract with you, where they're going to come in, they're going to test it. I, I know there's exceptions to the rules, but most aren't. Uh, but if you can boil it down, it's really just red are jerks and blue are willing to listen. And if you do that, then you've got purple, right? That's, that's really the end of it. Uh, so bug bounty programs. This is outsourced by definition, right? The whole idea is I'm going to crowdsource my offset program, or at least a piece of it. Uh, this notion of I've got many eyes looking at my stuff, but I only have to pay out occasionally when they actually find something, or as I like to say, it's like a dollar an hour, right? You got a thousand hours of theoretical review of your site, and you pay out a thousand dollars in bug bounties. There you go. Here's your dollar an hour. Um, another really good benefit to this that a lot of people don't seem to, to grasp is it is a mechanism for responsible disclosure. Um, when your CEO uh, gets an email out of the blue from somebody who says, hi, I'm a security researcher, I found a way to steal credit cards from your website. And he goes, yeah, it's me, i right? That's a problem. Uh, when he takes it, forwards it over to the you know, CIO, and the CIO eventually heads it over to the, whatever, the, the head of security for this particular business unit, and they sit on it for nine months, and then it turns out it's legit and they go to YouTube and they publish how to do it. That's a big bad problem, right? That was too oddly specific. Um, that never occurred. Um, so if you've got a program like, like this in place, you get these things and you can just say, hey, guess what? Come on over here, we've got a bug bounty program. Just come submit your detail over here and we'll go triage it like we triage everything. And if you are just a lying sack of poo that's trying to go for deep pockets or try to get a contract or whatever you're after, you're just, like, just annoying us. I can send you over here and keep you away from the executives, and I can put you in a spot where somebody that's technical can, can kind of validate you, right? Uh, so this is great, because then it doesn't go to the media, to the Twitter, to the CEO's inbox, to the front page of major media. Um, not that that's ever going to happen. Uh, so, but here's the deal. If you're going to do the bug bounty program, make sure that you fix the pen test findings that have actually been reported, because if you don't, you'll have this. You'll pay twice. Uh, I may have experienced this, uh, where there are pen tests that, that, you know, or we have a bug bounty come in, and the bug bounty researcher says, hey, you're getting cross site scripting your website. And I'm like, where was that? Yeah, hold on. Here's three reports for the last three years where that was there. You're going to pay, you're actually going to fix it now? That's awesome. Glad we're going to finally fix it, right? So, uh, stuff like this. Make sure that you just, just pre-fix it so you don't pay a second time. You've already paid a pen tester to come do it, whether it's an FTE or contracted out or whatever it is. Just clean your house first. Um, let's talk about public versus private bounty programs first, for a second. So in the public world, um, not only get to see the participants, so the, the name of your company, but they also get to see the, the bugs, the payouts, the remediation progress, all the stuff that gets tracked by that, that payment provider, that bug bounty uh, provider, it's all there. And in a private world, they only get to see, um, the invited people get to see this, right? So you have an invite list and there's some, some trust, some verification, and, and the different uh, providers do it in different ways. Um, the question I've got, and this, this is a good, good, um, good segue. One of one of the sponsors recently put out a thing, and, and this really made, possibly made me think. Um, where they're basically saying that bug bounty is eating commodity pen tests in many ways. And my first reaction is, nah, there's no way. But in many ways, if you've got a pen test that all they're doing is hitting an externally facing web app, and you've got just a handful of things, there's not a lot of difference at the end of the day, except for the incentive model. And I'm a big fan of incentives, and bug, bug bounty programs can actually turn the incentives around, where you can find a lot of these same problems and potentially do it in a, in a less expensive way. It's not a, I don't think it's there yet, but I think this is something to watch. Watch where this is, where this is headed. So from a career tips perspective, Johnny Q says, hey, yeah, bug bounties are good practice. Um, they're a good experience. Definitely go after them. Um, if nothing else, like if you're if fresh out of college and you're or you're early in your career and you're really trying to you want to break into the pen testing world, 
and you go and say, hey, I went to one of, I'm not going to name any bug bounty uh, program moderators, but you go to one of those and you participate and you say, look, I did this and I found these vulnerabilities. A lot of them have a score and you can go verify it and all, all this kind of stuff. You get like a reputation value out of it. You can say, hey, um, I'm new to this, this field. I haven't gotten into the field yet, but look, I went and did this work and it's verifiable. And we can say, hey, you know what? You're not just some straight out of college kid that has no experience. You, you've got something that's of value and we can, we can really help you out. Um, in that regard, I wish this stuff was around when I was fresh out of college because this was a really big chicken and egg problem back way back then. So to recap, we have shiny offset programs. All of these. We talked about them. Red teaming, purple teaming, outsourcing versus hiring, and uh, of course bug bounties. So with that, are there any questions? Yeah. So you talked about the different screens that are red team, red team goes further, you get more insight, from the So especially if you go the outsourcing route, how do you ensure that you're actually going to... If you go the what route? The outsourcing route? Yep. How do you ensure you get that extra value for the extra money you pay, and you don't just still get the money stock? So if I understand you correctly, if you go the outsourcing route for red teaming, how do you make sure you get the extra value out of the red team engagement? Correct? Yeah, it's like a long beyond uh, for above and above, beyond basic. So I, if I were to hire an outsourced red team to do an engagement, I would look at the reputation of that firm, and that to me would be everything. So it would be the types of stuff that they, they produce, uh, the types of um, publications, the point they've shared back with the community, um, and also it would look really heavy into the methodology that they plan on dis discussing with you. I wouldn't just take anybody run of the mill for that. Um, and again, this, like I said, this is a loaded subject. There's a lot of people that claim things are red team. I, I've talked to people that say, hey, I'm red team, okay, what's, and my favorite um, answer is actually, so there's a guy named Sean Malone who works for FusionX, and, um, and Sean will say, what does red team mean to you? <laughs> That's every time I've ever heard him talk with somebody, you know, say, hey, yeah, we did blah, blah, blah with red team. He goes, what does that mean to you? And he makes them define it first, and then he will tell you what, whether or not that that is his definition or not. So, because some people, red team is uh, vulnerability assessment. Some people, red team is just straight up normal pen test. Um, and some people, it's like pen test with a little bit of dabbling in this movement. And then other people, it's like, I am going hardcore. I'm going to mimic these particular threat actors with this exact type of TTPs, these exact techniques, right? And with these very specific objectives. It's not, I'm going to go pop shell, get doing them in, screenshot it, and get out. That's not, that's not good enough. It's going in there and saying, hey, I'm going to come in and I'm going to look like this particular organized criminal type of group. Maybe not by name, but some are actually, I, I know some guys that are getting to the point where they're like naming the threat actor groups by name. Like, they're going to say, AP228, we're going to go do exactly what they're doing. We wash them, whatever. Uh, to me, that's maybe too far down the other side. Um, but going in and saying, hey, I'm going to act like an organized criminal group. I'm going to come in. My, my target objective is to get credit card data, HR data, whatever that is, and exfiltrate it. Notice I didn't say my, my objective is to get domain admin, generate a golden ticket, dance around, and give you a screenshot, right? That's not it, because I'll tell you right now, um, if, if I know that you're watching things like domain admin and golden tickets, and, I can, and my, my objective is to get HR data, and I can fish one HR analyst that has access to the HR system, and without going admin at all, exfiltrate all the data out, I win. Right? As the bad guy. So that would be my, my objective would be to go as low and slow. So somebody that really gets and really thinks in a very, very mature model about the objective, that would be what I would choose. Does that make sense? Any other questions? <laughs> yes, Chris. Um, in bug bounty programs, yes. how do you limit the risk of unvetted resources? In bug bounty programs, how do you limit the risk of unvetted resources? This is not a question I can, I'm con like, so this is the thing that I think is the one last hurdle. And I can tell you, I've had some offline conversations with um, somebody who is high up in one particular bug bounty uh, firm that I won't name. And what they basically say is they, they run their researchers, I don't really like that title, it's not a good title, testers, whatever you want to call them, but I think they, they use the term researcher. They run them through the normal program for a period of time. They establish a certain level of credibility. They establish, uh, based on like the types, not just um, it's the types of findings, that their findings generally are valid, they're generally accepted, they're, they're high value, um, they're quality, they deal with the client in a respectful way. All those sorts of things get kind of get scored and you kind of build a reputation. 
of that person over a period of time. And then at that point in time, then they start talking about, we're gonna have a private bug bounty program in place of a standard pen test program at a Fortune 1000 company or whatever. And you're gonna give them some sort of trusted access and then that bug bounty program in exchange, as I understand it, would basically say, we're going to take on some of that risk. We're gonna identify you from this bad actor. We're gonna vouch for this person. We're gonna do some sort of outside third party validation, even though they may not even be a person in the, in the same country. Right, they're gonna do some sort of a, we know who this person is, we know where they where they live, we know how to pay them, and we've seen quality resort results. So to me, that's the last hurdle of the reputation piece, and it, as soon as they really figure that out and really know how to market and sell it, I think you're gonna see a lot of generic pen test shops that just say, hey, I pointed Nessus at your thing, and here you go. I think you're gonna see those start to go out the window in exchange for these, I'm gonna get paid per bug kinds of models, right, because the incentives are just different. But that, that's a great question. That's the exact question I asked him. Was, how do you get over that that one issue? You solve that, and then then maybe I would be sold on the concept completely, all right? Yep. So, all right. So I have a, I'm starting to found a, a need to get some writing. Yep. Right? My business is in IT security. I need to get some evaluation by external facing, whatever the case may be. I go out and I want to get a red team. How do I get red team results out of that concept? What do I need to think about? Look at how do I think about characterizing the guys that I want to have involved with the red team? So, restate the question back. So, brand new blue team, brand new program, not a security company, regular, some other industry, um, and I want to do some sort of perimeter analysis, right? So, first of all, perimeter analysis, I don't know that I would even necessarily go to the red team model first. First things first, I would just vault scan from the outside. I would go to a vulnerability scanning service first because. Um, if, you know, uh, we don't really rely on there being a remote code execution vulnerability in a, an IP on your network that's exposed to the internet. We find them, we like it when we find them, we actually do a little dance, because it's that rare these days, right? That to actually find something like that. Uh, in fact, what we're more likely to find is some weird subtle thing that is there that if combined with two or three other weird subtle things, then we can get code execution. And that's the only reason why you haven't been popped by it, right? It's not likely that you're gonna go find like Tomcat, Admin and Admin, default creds with full like upload a war file and get a shell on your on a box that's on it. those days unfortunately I'm biased. Those days fortunately <laughs> are gone. From a from a testing perspective, when you want when your goal is to get in, of you know, it's obviously it's a disproportionate. But so what I would do is I'd start there. I would say, all right, vault scan first. Just what's out there. Let's figure out what our service is, what our inventory is, just basics of security, right? What inventory do I have? What what uh, Vols are there, go get those first, and then I would only consider a red team when I'm really ready to look at that juicy middle section, because that whole idea of a parameter is is, is kind of, you know, everybody knows here that that's not really a thing anymore, right? Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. But then, like, how do you, how do you get the purple effects out of them? So, um, what I would do is I, I would make it upfront, so let's just say you're, whoever you're dealing with, you're gonna contract this out, I would make it upfront that I want to go through um, uh, one additional hours, basically. So you're telling your client or your your uh, business partner, your your uh, consulting firm, that hey, I want additional hours at the end of this for an out brief where we're not just doing a, a talk and not just doing a slide deck and whatever. You're going to sit down with somebody on the on the defense side and you're going to walk through the at least like three or four or five major steps in the exploit chain that were actually a big deal and talk about what those are so they can see it from both sides and reproduce those. Um, we were talking earlier with some people, what we do is after our tests, we call up these things purple team controls efficacy tests. It's a big fancy thing that just basically says, hey, we didn't see this, why not? Let's go figure out how in the world do we figure out how to see this one thing. That's great. Makes sense. Yep. Yeah. Any other questions? Awesome. Thank you.